Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay Moore. This is Greg Cruz. This is Dan. This Stone. is Dexter from the this Offspring. Is Nathan this East. is Sebastian Younger. This is David Lab. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Jalef. I'm Chris This is Dr. Bob Greenberg. I'm Laird Hamilton. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Gray. Hey, I'm Mark Valley. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hi, this is Andy Summers, and you are listening to the Break It Down Show. And now, the Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero, Mark Valley, and Pete A. Turner. Andy Summers has been a photographer who has displayed his work internationally and a film composer, having scored two of my favorite films, Wildlife and Weekend at Bernie's, among others. Of course, he's probably best known for being one of Rolling Stone's 100 Greatest Guitarists of All Time. And he's with us to promote his upcoming shows at the Regent in L.A. and the Palace of Fine Arts in San Francisco in support of his latest solo album, Tribal Luminescence. Pete and I love his work. We love his personal style, and we're elated to have him on. Andy, thanks for joining us. Nice to be here. Just from the bottom of my heart, thank you for all you've done for us. I love I love art, and I love seeing what good art is, and so thank you. I appreciate you. Mm-hmm. We met Dennis. Your guitar tech. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he did you a great service by, we knocked on the door, mm-hmm. he answered the door, we said, hi, this is, we're John and Pete, and we're here to see Andy. And he straightened his shoulders up and looked us square in the face and said, no, you're not. <laughs> and we thought, <laughs> oh, we like this guy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He, he has a, a good English sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You guys have been together for a while, I think. Yeah, we've pretty much worked uh, since the 80s. And uh, yeah, no tennis, no Andy. That's the way it goes now. Wow. You know, yeah, it's a. Uh, it, we work very well together. You know, obviously on many levels. Uh, I mean, currently we're doing photography. Dennis has been responsible for a lot of the tech side of being able to put this show together. And of course, he's, he's we've done five million music shows all over the world. Dennis is always with me doing the tech side. You know, like we're going off to Brazil in June, and he'll be down there just making sure everything's together yeah um so currently you know you know i just played in arizona at the uh, mim the musical instrument museum which is a really wonderful place they have a beautiful theater there and we, we sold that out and played on tuesday night and this is where i play to um projected photography so we're streaming photography we you know that's a, a little different setup technically for most venues they were very good at the uh, mim you know, it's photography that I've shot all over the world, China, Nepal, um, Tibet, Myanmar, Southeast Asia. So there's a lot of quite exotic photography uh, that runs, and I have various tracks playing to it, and I play. And I, some of it I play just solo, improvising. And some of it I use a back, one of like a tra- backing track from Tribal Luminescence, where I, you know, I literally go back to Pro Tools, take out the original lead guitar part maybe, and then use the rest of it to... Um, you know, play to uh, where I project the photography. But so it's a multimedia show. Mm. I do a little Q and A. I play. I play some solo guitar pieces. Do a Q and A. I also read some short stories uh, that I've been writing for a few years now. That are right, sort of bleak, like black comedy stories that somehow <laughs> or other will involve a guitar or music of some sort. So there is a sort of thematic approach to it. But mostly they're about how can I put this politely? Situations that don't go well. <laughs> yeah. What art do you not participate in? Because you write, you yeah. score, you paint, you yeah. picture. Well, I, you know, I mean, I'm a believer that, uh, you know, one thing can lead you into another. You, you know, I mean, obviously my initial information comes from music. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I started as a kid. I had piano lessons for years and I picked up the guitar. Of course, that became the complete obsession. I w- you know, I went to college in California. So I became a fairly highly trained musician, you know, but I, you know, I not dabbled because I don't think that's the right word. My initial uh, impulses were to jazz, jazz improvisation when I was a kid because that was the hippest thing to do. And, you know, I was really trying to figure out, you know, hundreds of hours of time of, of what was Montgomery was playing or people like that. Mm-hmm. So many hours hunched over a record play and trying to get every solo note for note until I could do that. I could play all of West Coast Blues solo at 16, which was pretty good. What drew you to North Northridge then? The, the um well, I ended up out here sort of by default, and I got very much into music study, classical guitar, and one thing led to another, and I, I ended up going to Northridge and for the next four years and uh, doing that. 
I put literally put down the electric guitar and picked up the classical guitar and and just went for it for about five years. Hmm. Then came back to the electric guitar and then sort of poured it all into one thing and then suddenly I was in this rock band called The Police. <laughs> We've heard of them. <laughs> yeah. As a somebody with a jazz background and all the improv therein, when yeah. you do a multimedia show like this where you take out your lead track and you play yeah. against it, how much do you allow yourself space to improvise? Well, it's pretty good, you know, and I, it's interesting because. You know, I made the recording of Tribal Luminescence, which is fairly complex and sort of exotic. But I've already felt like live on such, you know, I could go back on the track for this purely live purpose and add some more drums. There's, there's, there's a lot more because it's fairly spaced out in the guitar. So, you know, obviously right. the studio thing is different. Now, live, I think I'm thinking, you know what, I could use a bit more drumming in there. And I might go back and do some drums on, on a couple of the things I'm playing. This is just what I'm finding out after one show. Uh -huh. I mean, it all went very well, but I, I, I know what I would like to hear a bit more of to play against. It's just kind of, well, it is musical. It's absolutely musical and, uh, you know, technical at the same time. So before we do the LA show, I might address a couple of issues like that. But there's a lot of space. Yeah, it's purely, you know, I'm not, I don't have a, a set thing. Yeah. Because the original parts, say, on the track. And your explorations there. Yeah, this, it's true. You know, I mean, this is like any band, any live situation. You go out, you do one show, and you immediately learn in one show far more than you did in a month of rehearsal. Right. right. I know. <laughs> okay, here's what, you know, we, Dennis and I uh, immediately got in touch. Like, okay, do this, let's do that, let's do that, let's shorten it, you know. You know. So, yeah, it's, it's it's typical. So, you know, you see a show in January, you see it again in August, and boy, it's really streamlined. Yeah. This is what, this is a natural process. Sure. How much does a show change, though, once you, you and Dennis have it locked in and you know what yeah. it's supposed to be? Well, it went down extremely well the other night, and I, of course, was very pleased. Right. Because, you know, I don't think people have seen anything quite like this before, and even the way I start the show is pretty avant-garde. Yeah. You know, it's... it's You're avant-garde? I don't buy it. <laughs> I wait till you see the show, man. You know, you know. No, it is. It's you know, there's abstraction in there. It's not just like a, a catchy melody. This is something else altogether. Yeah. But it's fairly compelling because the, of the guitar sounds I use. You know, and all this is just choices I've made with with the photography. It all works together. That's the whole point of like, I'm bringing this multimedia show and I'm matching the playing and the music to to the photography. Yeah. But I think it's fairly unique because, you know, I, I've been very privileged to have traveled in a lot of very exotic countries and, and done some, like, art, fine art photography. I don't go out into places like China and do National Geographic. I'm looking for surrealism because I've done this m for quite a few years now. So I have a big collection to draw from. What's interesting is why did it take me so long to get around to this? Yeah. Because I've been doing this for years, you know, photography and you know, it's a big thing for me. Uh, you know, it's just like music. You know, I'm very into it. It's improvisational. You know, I'm making choices, aesthetic decisions. And, yeah, I never thought really to marry it up with music and do a live show of it. And it was only, well, actually, I'll tell you what the seed was for it. was We did it last year all in a huge hurry uh, at the Grammy Museum in L.A. And it went down storm. I did it in about two days. Like, so I, I said to them, oh, I'll come down. They said, do you want to be at the Grammy Museum, do a little thing? I said, yeah, sure. Okay, sure. Yeah. I'll do photography and music. I never even realized what I was saying. And then, of course... You just blurted out the words sort of, and then you were stuck to you're it. You're exactly right. <laughs> I sort of blurted it out. And then, of course, I dropped myself in this deep hole and went, oh, my God. You know, and, and we had to, we sort of very hurriedly pulled it together. But it went down great. And that was when I went, huh, okay, I think we should take this idea and run with it and expand it. So it's been a phenomenal amount of work, but hugely enabled by the digital revolution because I've got all my chosen pictures, let's say, up on a big 27-inch screen. Yeah. And now I never used to be able to do that. So everything has become doable. It's still yeah. very time-consuming. I mean, I mean, literally, going back to the negatives, scanning them, bringing them down, work, reworking the picture in Photoshop. Ask, bring yeah. it up. Oh, yeah, it's, it's mm -hmm. a whole process. So we've gotten through 
a great deal of it, but I think already we would add more and you know refine and change the sequences a little bit. It's typical. As you do create this this tapestry with the pictures, I saw New Order play at the Hollywood Bowl. You know they've mm. got this same show they've done for a number of years now, but they've got it down like they move in time with the images behind yeah. them, and it's incredible. Yeah. But as you take these pictures and you you're in Nepal or wherever yeah. it is. Yeah. The picture can say one thing, but then you can go in later and and filter it and change it to make it say something. Or do you stick with textualize the, it really? Yeah, musically. exactly. Or do you stick with image as it is in well, its natural state? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a sort of multi pronged answer to that. You know, obviously, I'm going to try to make very compelling images. You know, it's like yeah. anything. Not every not every photograph I shoot is a great one. Right. There's always just some crap in there. It's just <laughs> it's inevitable yeah. if you shoot a lot. But. I'm very good at it. So yeah. what can I say in my eye? Like it's, it's just like music, a talent of music. You develop it, you develop it, you refine it, and you get you 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 definitely get better at it. And uh, I think my average is higher than it was say 20 years ago. Sure. So, and I think doing things like this gives you more information. You go, yeah, okay. Now when I go out next time, I'm going to go and I'm going to be looking for certain things. You know, I'm trying to match the music to the photography. Uh, I think it's working really well. Uh, what can I say it's, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting to, to see what what it's going to do to me. Yeah. You know, if I go out and do this for six months, and then I go off to Turkey or somewhere, and and shoot a bunch of photographs, I'll have like some other things in my head. Uh-huh. Yeah. Also, you know, a big factor in you know, it's like now when we played at the MIM in Arizona the other night, you know, we're on a gigantic screen. It's very thrilling for me to see my pictures this big. It's like I made a movie. Amazing. So, you know, there's a difference between, you know, the horizontal actually looks much better on the screen because it fills the whole screen. And I've tended for many years to shoot, turn the camera on its side and shoot vertically because Mm. I'm always thinking about pages in a book. Vertical tends to work better. But this setup, you need more horizontal images. So... These are little things that you yeah. come in. That inform what your, they do. What your they eye do. is. Yeah. So we have uh, Robert Greenberg, the composer, is a mm-hmm. frequent guest. And mm-hmm. one of the things he's told us about is that Beethoven was writing music for the piano before the piano existed. Because yeah. physically they couldn't build something that would play those notes. But he still yeah. knew somehow intuitively to go ahead and write for it. Because yeah. someday it would happen. Yeah. I think that what you're describing is a convergence of the things that you've shot thousands and thousands of images from around mm-hmm. the world mm-hmm. over years, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. now meeting a place where, oh, now I can use these things. Yeah. And if you're going to project images, now it changes what you're looking through your lens at yeah. because of yeah. that. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I like this kind of... Uh, the mixing of the two and and to see what it, if it produces yet another baby you know it's it, it is an interesting mm-hmm. situation i'm just sort of surprised that i didn't do it before did i yeah i don't know you know cuz what i like uh, you know there's a sort of place it's fulfilled for me and this initially came from the photography because when i was a kid in my hometown in England, I used to go to a place called the Continental Cinema, and I saw, you know, the Truffaut films, the Bergman, the Fellini, mm-hmm. Black Orpheus, all these that were, you know, I'm like 16, 17 years old. These had a huge emotional impact on me, and I said, that's what I want to do. I want to do that, you know, this this black and white films I saw that were so uh, compelling. But, of course, I was obsessed with the guitar. Yeah. yeah. So my head really never came up from the from the guitar. It's like, oh well, you know, you could really be a filmmaker or something. And so many, you know, fast forward a few years, and then you know, I'm in the police, and you know, suddenly we've got all this time on our hands. I'm like, oh my god, I'm going to be on the road for the next ten years, just sitting in <laughs> hotel rooms. I'll do photography. You better take yeah. up a hobby. You know, it's like, all right, well, I'll be a good photographer. You know, just like that. And um, of course, I was surrounded by photographers, and I I got a very nice Nikon FE, I think, in New York, and I started. Going for it. Yeah, no, huh. I never know whether I had really any feeling for it. I, you know, it, after a week, I, it didn't. I didn't put it away. Right. It's I was fun. into it. Yeah. yeah. And so obviously it was in me. And you know, later I realised, uh, you know, this shooting this stuff and looking at these incredible photographers like Robert Frank and Ralph Gibson and Lee Friedland, all the great American Diane Arbus. It was it 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 fulfilled something. I mean, not that it I wasn't fulfilled in music, obviously, but um, I think I was picking up on that thing that I got when I was a kid from all those great European art house movies, and started to you know spend a lot of time with the camera as well. Because I, obviously, when you're on the road, 
you, you have you have time. Yeah, you have time to do this stuff. You're at the point in your career where you've built a legacy, and and you get to make the choices that you want to do, whatever it is. Let me say this, Pete. Yeah. I think there are people out there who wonder, golly, I hate, you know, how is it these rock stars get paid all this money? But this is why, <laughs> because there are sensibilities in the human experience that we want to feed. And when somebody comes along and has something to contribute that make the rest of us wake up in a way, mm, mm. we want to give somebody the freedom to yeah. explore these things because yeah. they take us yeah. and they take humanity in a direction. Yeah. That's a huge responsibility. Yeah. How do you feel about it? Well, that? it is, it is. <laughs> and you know, I guess in my purest, most spiritual part of my being, you know, you hope that you are actually contributing something and, and waking people up to something, you know. So, you know, I mean, very simply put, you, you do a concert. Yeah. I hope people walk away feeling better about everything, you sure. know, like, like, oh, man, that's a waste of time. No, they feel better about life, you know, and uh, everything's good. And somehow it was a really good moment. Mm -hmm. And, you know. Having learned something, having yeah, been enlightened yeah, somehow. Yeah, you do. You know, you don't want to, like, talk about that too much. But you do hope that, you know, underneath all of that there, you're sure. contributing something to people's lives. Otherwise, why are you doing that? <laughs> well, yeah, and if, you, yeah. if you'll indulge us washing your balls for a minute. Uh, <laughs> the the, uh, the thing that makes sure. your... Uh, we, uh, yeah, we jabbed at each other a little bit. It was fun. But yeah. the, uh, the thing that made your guitar playing stand apart, I think, and, and you know, made your playing special was probably the, that all those European art house films informed, yeah. Yeah. you know, your uh, musical yeah, textures. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, I started off being like a complete jazz freak, and then I was getting into Coltrane and Miles as a yeah. kid, mm -hmm. you know, and all the hippest musicians were in New York, and this was the scene. You know, of course, later on, you know, you, I lived in London, I'm in our rhythm and blues band, and then it was James Brown, Ray Charles, Otis Redding, and yeah. Rufus Thomas, and all this sure, stuff that yeah. we played, because we were a very popular band, and this is where it all started. But I was always absolutely, uh, you know, apart from playing... Papa's got a brand new bag. I was a guitar student. Right. I was studying all kinds of stuff and harmony and everything. And, and then finally, you know, came to the States and I, you know, I went to Northridge. I took classical, you know, and I, I did all that. So I became, you know, it got, you know, the, the quest for music, it got deeper and deeper. And this is, and I'm talking about harmonic knowledge, real, real. Very studious. Yeah, very, yeah, like really knowing your, 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 the art and the craft of it, not like, oh, I can play a few chords, this, you know, or I only play the blues, or I just do rockabilly. It's, I was different. This was my thing. Mm -hmm. So by the time I got to, like, the police and Sting, uh, Sutton Stewart, um, I was, you know, reasonably well-formed as a musician. I could play my ass off, and I knew a lot of music. I played a lot of classical guitar. Mm -hmm. And Sting in particular and I had very similar music background. He was very into classical guitar, he loved Bach and Villalobos, as I did, and I could play these pieces to him. He said, go on, play that one, play that one from that prelude. This is how we started. Yeah, Not standard rock band stuff. Mm -hmm. And he was coming out of jazz fusion group. I played jazz since I was a kid. So, yeah. But we were a rock band, and right. we were in the punk era. So we had to take those <laughs> sensibilities uh. somehow and like ugh, kind of hoist them into being a rock band. Yeah. So. Hence, you know, you hear a band that is really sound is different than any sort of standard rock band, particularly because I was playing certain things on the guitar that other guitarists weren't playing. So it was a, a question of natural instinct and taste and specific avoidance of things that made us sound like anybody else. So be, when you get like a voice like Sting's, which is so wonderful, and, you know, those reggae, simple lines that we took out of reggae bass lines, and then Stuart playing in that kind of middle tempo thing and picking up on this, and then the harmonies, you start to get something that, man, this is That sounds different. like nothing else. Right, nothing else. Yeah. And has never been equaled, actually. Going back to your, your artist sensibility now where you're at, you, you've, you've got the, the Otis Redding and all that stuff mm. in the past, obviously your success in the police, but you've, for a long time, been able to make whatever decisions you want. Who who are your kind of, your touch points? You, you know, as you combine media together, you know, you look at someone like, I'm looking at your, your bookcase and you got Picasso. Mm. He mm. had different eras, different mm. things he mm. did. If he was mm. alive now, he probably yeah. would make similar. Who's out there yeah. in front of you you look at? No one. <laughs> no, but, that's, but that's fair because yeah, you, are, you are avant-garde. Yeah. Well, know? yeah. And I no mean, one has cut this path. No, no one had the technology. I think I'm to doing something path. right now that's really pretty unique. And um, 
there's an interesting little sort of prelude to this, let's say, you know, because obviously, you know, I was developing my visual sensibilities over the years. And I've been lucky to have had a very strong, uh, close friendship with really the one of the all time greatest photographers uh, is a guy called Ralph Gibson. And he's in New York. He's wonderful. And I met him in the uh, year in 19, late 82, 83. And I was living in New York. And he helped me produce my first photo book which was okay. called throb it was a strange how it got set up i won't even go into the whole long story of that but um i connected with him and i felt like i connect connect in a way i sort of connected into the the continuum of american art photography hmm. great guy we totally hit it off as two guys hanging in new york and doing all this stuff and yeah he, he also had to play the guitar it was really you know passionate music person and was like probably one of the really greatest photographers of all time. So he became my mentor. And so I, I got a lot of sensibility uh, from him and he learned stuff on the pure inside that I would never have gotten from, like, say, a rock photographer. Sure, okay. So this was very important because this was like the real deal. This was an extremely hip, uh, cutting-edge, fine art sensibility in photography. Uh, we're still very tight friends. And... Anyway, fast forward many years, about two years ago, because we've done things together. We did a book together. We've done little appearances together. We've done stuff over the years as we can. I mean, really, he's a photographer. I'm a guitar player. But I take photographs, and he plays a guitar. Right. So it's been <laughs> I always want to be something else. Yeah. <laughs> so there you go. Um, it's funny how we go like this. We sort of trail each other like this. <laughs> it's, it's incredible. <laughs> we were going to try and do, and it might still come to fruition, um, a uh, dance thing in new york like um you know we were going to create visuals and music for a dance program with a famous uh new york choreographer called carol armitage and she was up for it because it's very very expensive to put dance on so it's been a while we haven't really got there yet so i said okay ralph was going to make the videos and i was going to do the the music so I started into it with a lot of enthusiasm, and I was really thinking about dancers, mm. not like, okay, I've got to make a rock album or something. This is, I'm like visualizing dancers on stage and uh, movement. And Do cutting. you think in dancing style then when you're doing yeah, this? Yeah, well, very much modern dance, not okay. ballet, modern dance right. and trying to make it quirky and interesting. So my, my sensibilities were going there, and so I started to create a lot of music, and I'm in my studio in LA, Ralph's in New York. It's much easier for me because I'm in my studio, my environment that I know so well. So I started making all this thing and it didn't look like in that period it was going to come to fruition. But I I put so much music together. I thought, well, you know, you, man, I can't waste all this effort. So I have to I'll, let me kind of w slightly remold it until it becomes an album. And that became the album called Metal Dog. Right. So that was 2015, I think that came out. So that's where it started from. It started from that, like trying to make music to a visual aesthetic. You see, so it was all playing into it. But that got me into writing really from a sonic bass, not like working out a whole, you know, like melody, harmony, you know, A, A, B, B, C, and another outtake solo, A, B, you know, like standard song structure. Even if it is instrumental, I started being more experimental with it and using a lot of uh, crazy sonic sounds that were influenced by world music and mm. Balinese gamelan and all this and starting to try and bring it into what I was doing. So it's more experimental, avant-garde, cutting edge. I mean, you still have to play very well. Right. Guitar, so, it's yeah. whatever. so that's where, that's how it sort of be came about. And I felt like this is sort of like meta jazz. So... There's a jazz sensibility in there, but it's not really jazz. It's more, it's got these much more exotic instruments in it. And so instead of, say, like a piano playing chords, you know, that you would solo over, I would have loops, exotic loops, you know, combined with percussion. So I started to move into a new kind of musical territory. Can you just jump that far ahead, though, or do you need to progress to that frontier that you're on? Because that's definitely, to have the... Comfort, not to say the courage, but the comfort to say, I'm not going to solo over a piano playing chords. <laughs> and I'm going to yeah. grab these exotic things and loop them. Yeah. Uh, of course, I've been around music for a lot, long time, so I have a lot of knowledge about, you know, Brian Eno, ambient music, other stuff. And remember, I made those two records with Robert Fripp in the yeah. in mid 80s that were very, you know, influential. And they were hit records. And that came from me 
basically the idea of doing that but uh so you know i'm very aware of all kinds of music and so it's in my head all that but this time i really sort of wanted to push into this more sonic territory but that doesn't mean that it's ugly to listen to mm-hmm. you you've got to make it you, you know the way, i mean specifically i'll you know set up equipment in the studio whatever and it's very experimental i'm trying things i'm hooking things up differently until i you know I go yeah man i think that's Mm, there's something that's something let's yeah. uh, record 20 bars of that 16 bars whatever yeah and let's see if i can play over it or i could extend it let's see if we can extend it into another piece so it's a setup to you know first thing okay it's a very fresh point i haven't heard anything quite like that now let me see if i can develop it into a composition so this is all very much in the studio but you know you still got to have your composing shots and build it into something that makes Right. Sense on some level. So that's when you st- stole Dennis from Robert Fripp. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and it was. He, he came, yeah. came over because you had some esoteric <laughs> sensibility to these thought, you know what? This isn't bonkers. I'm going to follow this. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was very nice. I was working, you know, I met Fripp. I, the thing is about Fripp and my, myself is that we were teenage guitarists in the same town in England. Mm-hmm. Not rivals exactly because uh, he was... No, no, we were, compl- we were just kids, you know, mm-hmm. we were, no yeah. one knew who we were. He actually passed through a band that I was in. Um, many years later, I got t- together. He helped me out when I was sort of down and out in London, back in London. And then later, you know, of course, I was in the police and uh, suggested that uh, we make a record together. You know, the two guitar players from, from Bournemouth in England. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of crazy. And we actually went back to Bournemouth where we... Uh, grown up and there was an engineer there called uh, Tony Arnold that was a sort of towering figure around because he had a couple of American guitars when we were kids now we're talking about <laughs> rural England I love it. and uh, yeah yeah it's crazy stuff we got together with him and he was a wonderful engineer and we made we eventually made the two two records but early on I think it was in the first one which was called I Advance Masked we were trying to work I think it was with an Oberheim drum machine and we couldn't get it to work this bloody thing and the Tony Arnold, the engineer, said, oh, no, this guy, his name's Dennis, and he, he's stupid yeah. this stuff. Let, let's get him over. <laughs> and anyway, Dennis turned up. We were all a lot younger then. And guess what? He got the thing working. And, um, oh, great. You know, this, you know, he had that kind of focus. Yeah. Very good. I was too impatient for it. And he stuck around. You know, he suddenly he wouldn't leave. <laughs> everything got better. You know, suddenly yeah. everything sounded better. Everything was in place. You know, he, he did everything. You know, the leads looked good. He made the tea. And suddenly, you know, everything was like kind of in a better state. And I said, well, this guy's really good. So, you know. Yeah. This it, is good. And, you know, yeah. I brought him up to London. And we did a couple of things. And he went back home. And then he came up again. You know, eventually I got, you know, it got to, I can't do it without. <laughs> right. It's like it's like glasses where, like, it becomes yeah. part of you. Like, yeah, yeah, I need this to see the world yeah. in a better way. We're absolutely a team. And uh, basically, I no Dennis, no Andy. That's the way it is now. Right. <laughs> it's over. <laughs> well, I'm not ashamed to say that a lot of the guests that we get, we, you know, we progress. And, hey, if we talk to this guy, maybe he'll introduce us to that guy. And so mm. I, maybe it's maybe we're we're coming to see you just so we can get a little closer to Dennis. I, I think that's the way it goes because he's, he's the real star. <laughs> I'm yeah. just the idiot with the guitar, you know, but the real deal is him. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, in our preparation, you know, we... Pete and I will talk. What do you want to ask Andy Summers? And one of the things that we wanted to ask you about was the the progression of a songwriter throughout life. Mm. And at some point, you get to you know where you're being listened to by a bunch of teenagers because you're writing songs about chasing girls. Yeah. And then at some point, you, we evolve in in our lives. Maybe you become less relevant in a way that makes you a pop star because you're not writing songs about chasing girls anymore. This episode of the Break It Down Show is brought to you by Lions Rock Productions. That's us. We publish, evaluate, and develop podcasts just like this one, consult others to build their own, and create associated content and content marketing strategies. So if you're launching or expanding your social media presence, your business, or your personal brand, or if you just want to take your media presence to the next level, reach out to us on Twitter. At Pete A. Turner. Or at John LG69. At the Break It Down Show. There's a thousand ways to get a hold of us. Now enjoy the show. Uh, And so we wanted to ask you about what a songwriter goes through as life progresses, and then suddenly you throw all this esoteric stuff about us, uh, about your process, and it makes that question kind of bullshit. But. Well, no, no. I think, you know, I absolutely respect songwriting as a craft. Um. 
but it doesn't really advance in in the sense that you still got a, a song, you know, unless you, you totally freeform. Like, well, is that a song or what is it? You know, I mean, you know, we all know like this. You know, you got to have an intro, then you have a right. the mm-hmm. verse, then you right. probably have another one. You might go. There might be a little instrumental break. You could even do a third one. See, there are all these song forms, and you might go to B, mm-hmm. right. the bridge. You come back. You might do a solo, or you have a little instrumental passage. There's there's all these there's various forms. You know, it depends what genre of music you're in, you know, and you have something called the climb and there's modern, very modern sensibility songwriting. Yeah. And the vamp. Yeah. The, the it's vamp. a set of stuff, you know, <laughs> right. there's a set of stuff and you learn it and you can, do, you can learn to do it. You know, I certainly do it. I know all, I, yeah, yeah. You, played, um, you played songs <laughs> from time to time. Yeah, I know it very well. Um, and even in, you know, Let's just go somewhere else. Like you're in jazz. I mean, most of the, the great jazz era, they're playing on you know standards. The great American songbook, you know, right? A A B A, maybe yeah. a C. You know, Cole Porter, Gershwin, all these were great songwriters. They right. were songwriters. When you get to let's say the late '60s, early '70s, songwriting became thing that everybody's supposed to be able to do. And of course, that wasn't really true. Not everybody's a gifted songwriter. And it's a real thing that you need to focus on if you want to be a great songwriter, more than being a virtuoso instrumentalist. And then it, every, it got to like where everybody had to make personal statements, and it got much more personal than yeah. you're supposed to write about life experiences. So in your life, if you're a songwriter and you go on, and then you get to like you're 50 years old, you're still writing songs, and you've been divorced twice, and you've got three kids, and you know, and a new dog. Uh, you start to write more inner stuff, mm-hmm. I would think, unless you're very commercial and you're writing for music, and there are plenty of those well, in that's LA. Well, that like the verse of voice of experience. Yeah. yeah, you can go, and you go, well, you know what? I don't really want to do it. Yeah. Uh, for me, it would be very personal. I made, I thought, a really great rock record about two or three years ago called Circa Zero. Yeah. Uh-huh. If you've never heard of that one, with a great singer called Rob Giles. And uh, anyway, it was, that's another kind of s- story. But... um very much about songwriting yes. real songwriting thinking about hooks and choruses and lyrics and how to make it fresh there's so much information you need to take in what is the song you know if it's you, are you the writer of the the composer of the music or are you the lyricist or are you both mm-hmm. see a lot of people want to be both doesn't always work out you know and people who tend to write very interesting lyrics lots of heavy lyrics tend not to be writing terribly interesting music because mm-hmm. they're trying to get so many words different in. discipline yeah really, you know a different approach you know it's it's it's, uh, it's something that as a songwriter you have to grapple with i think you know um how do you make the music interesting and have the lyrics be fresh you get i mean i can't really i don't want to sort of like diss anybody here but right sometimes you know certain songwriters you know i don't know if this is true in like sort of singer songwriter folk type stuff they're so intent on getting so many words literary on the page the the, the music is too simple Suffers. for my taste yeah. anyway, i don't want to hear it really think about somebody like sting of course who's you know a real musician plays extremely well and is very well right. versed harmonically mm-hmm. he sort of bridged that gap where he has got a very good uh lyric sensibility literary sensibility yeah, and he's well able read. to and his ears go to really hit music now these, these are rarity i would say yeah you know yeah we uh we do a little thing where we uh we put two albums together and this is completely cornball but like we'll go track one track one and we have them fight. it's a weekly like, segment yeah uh-huh. it's called the album fight yeah and so like you know track one will fight track one from two different albums two comparable great albums but mm-hmm. well, we treat it like a boxing match yeah, score yeah. It like a boxing match. it's a lot of fun but you're right you see that some of that sensibility where you've written a song it's very formulaic and in this goofy format that you never like you guys never would have thought of when you wrote an album uh-huh. um it isn't as good as the song that shows up for song three from the other album and it it's given us a real unique perspective as to the song songwriting craft Mm. And what goes into putting not just a song on an album, but 10 songs or 12 songs yeah. to make a, a thematic thing. When you guys, when you go to build an album, are you thinking in the album format still, or is that day gone? That was a really good and very uh, poignant question. Thank you. Because... Yes, Andy, you like my question. <laughs> okay, yeah. Okay, let's go there. Um what was the question again? You know, <laughs> <laughs> album album formats, right? Yeah. You do. No, yeah, yeah, right, right. Yeah, I do. You know, see, I'm totally Mr. Analog yeah. dude. 
I, you know, I grew up like many of us with whole albums, and that you were supposed to take this journey through the yeah, album. Yeah. And that's never left me. You know, I know we come to an age with kids now. You know, we've got Spotify and all this stuff. He said, not insulting any of it. Um, right. Whereas, you know, short attention span, very fast, quick. That's not what I spent my life doing or growing up with. I grew up with the whole art of like, you know, layering out an album, sequencing it. So there's a certain thing that you would go through. Mm-hmm. And, and that was what the artist intended. So my, you know, personally, my, you know, same time you want every track to stand on its own. Sure. But I like, my head has always been into, you know, okay, you're going to do about 12 tracks. So I do tend to think somewhat thematically and, you know, in terms of like, okay, we've got about an hour, uh, at least an hour of music here. Or what, what it, well, that's long, actually. Right. You know, maybe 48 minutes, 50 sure. minutes now. Yeah. No, that's the way I think. Absolutely. Well, now you also have a visual sensibility that feeds into it. And this goes yeah. back to the point that I made about why we want to enable a person's artistic growth, not just not just a musician, but a, an artist's growth, so that you can explore these things as a whole body of work and have the time to think and to have the continuity. Because we want to still go on this journey with you. And now yeah. if we're going to go on a multimedia journey with you, yeah, hopefully you've got the tools in your, and you clearly have them, but now that the demands of a multimedia show are going to require the you know continuity musically, mm. the entertainment mm. of us for an hour, but you're also thinking of the tie-ins visually mm. and, you know, and, and leaving yourself room to improvise. Yeah. Well, you know, I've spent my whole life doing this, and I do think along those lines because I write as well. I mean, in this show, I I read some short stories. It seemed to go extremely well the other night, and that's an interesting thing. Like, short stories, but they can't be too long right. because you're reading a story, and it, you read on about four minutes. Mm. There's a thing now as a genre in literature called you know, flash fiction or micro fiction. Right. Yeah, you've got about three or four pages. And you've got to condense it. And you've got to learn how to do that. Because I've got a lot of these things, which I've been ultimately thinking I would put out as a book. They're pretty funny, most of them. Um, but I can see live reading, you've got to, man, tighten yeah. it up. Because what you read on a page and you, you got to, when you're talking to an audience, you want to tighten that up. So I'm thinking a little bit about that. Yeah, it's not a person sitting in a park on a sunny day reading yeah. a book, no. you know, getting lost in a book. Right. You have a... Yeah an attention span yeah. to cater to. It's really the literary version of a pop song. It kind of is. Yeah, it, it really is. And uh, I really enjoy doing it. And I, I have a lot of these. But I'm looking at them and I'm going, okay, let me think, see if I can kind of micro this Condense up a little bit. Yeah, to, 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 to tighten it up. And some, you know, you know, you know, it's like editing and, and almost all art forms, whatever they are, they benefit from the tight edit. Mm-hmm. They, they only get better. They don't get weaker. So I'm, I'm going to look at that. Do you think, are you still improving as a musician in terms of, like, have you reached the pinnacle of technical chops and you have to go in a different direction? Not that you're limited technically, but, like, at some point you're just, the time... Stop to pay attention to the... Yeah. Like, if you're already at a 9.9, do you put 100 hours into becoming a 9.99, you know, or... Well, yeah. No, I mean, it's a really good point. And, you know, of course, I am the guy I am, and, you know, the guitar and music is in my head all the time. You know, I play guitar solos in my head, you know. When I'm going to sleep. Yeah. That's the way it is. Right. It's been like that since I was about 11. You know, nothing. Does your changed. internal jukebox <laughs> ever shut off? Not really. No. <laughs> but yeah, so you go, okay, who am I as a guitar player now? You know, what am, I, am I moving forward? Am I doing this? I'm doing that. I'm pretty, and I don't want to say satisfied because it sounds like you're, you're in stasis and right. I'm not. Yeah, right. Because it never ends. I play every day and I have to, you know, because it's physical. Yeah. And you have to be an athlete and you have to be able to have your chops up. And, and it's really true. If you play a lot, you're going to play better. Yeah. You play better. You know, when I was doing the show in Arizona, I sat in my room, played a couple of hours, you know, played the two hours at least the day before. So I get my hands really moving so I can get around. And I, you know, I think I play very well. And, and I, we I'm, think you play very well. well. <laughs> I'm doing my best, you know. Um, I know what I have and I know what other guitar players have. And I, I, I don't want to necessarily compete and be everything with a lot of young kids are out there playing you know there's a whole shredding school and that's not what i do right but i can do things they can't do you know um i have a different feel i know how strong my 
musical impulses are, how my, strong my feel is, my feel for pulse, and then I play drums as well. You know, I totally have it. And Those I play shredders a lot of are the guys who would never have come up with Murder by Numbers. Yeah. In you a see, million years. No, I, I mean, I appreciate this school that's come up with these, you know, super mm-hmm. fast, super light string, very yeah. light string players. In fact, I'll tell you a little story. I played um, in Shanghai um, not so long ago and on this festival. I did two days. Uh, two afternoons and i know a guy there who's helped me because i played in shanghai a lot and i said oh man you know can you, you know i'm not even going to bring a guitar you got a spare strat yeah okay, great great okay yeah very <laughs> nice guy he's a, he's a shredder but see this is the point he's a shredder and i said all right can you bring that strat and he had some pedals so i thought okay good we got, uh, okay i think i can make it through this show this killer you know yeah. bass player and drummer but he strung the guitar up for shredding which uh-huh. is super light stringing it he strung it with sixes or something i mean <laughs> man this stuff i went what is it like elastic it's bands. a speed yeah. machine it, it, it's like blah, 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 blah. yeah and he plays like that um, yeah. uh, i mean it's a whole other approach but I, I it wasn't for me i mean the strings were literally too light i mean i said oh man you don't, can't get a note out of this. Yeah. It's funny. Yeah, we we love live from Daryl South Daryl Hall's show that he yeah. does. And he had Billy Gibbons on. And Billy told yeah. this story of when he met B.B. King. And, yeah. and they were talking about strings. And yeah. Billy's like, I play these big, heavy strings. And B.B. looks at him and goes, why are you working so hard? Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. <laughs> it's just so great. So there's like a balance in there. Balance. Yeah. Well, this is all right inside stuff. You know, for instance, I did the show in um, uh, Arizona the other night. And... You know, I took a chance. I, I took out an old Gibson 330 with fairly heavy flat wound strings. Now, mm. this is not something I normally do. Yeah. Suddenly, I was getting this vibe off these strings. Really? And one thing that I've stopped, you know, in recent years, I play more and more without a pick. You know, I play, it's almost like African play, and I mm-hmm. play thumb, first finger, second finger, and I'm lightning fast with it. Yeah. And I suddenly I was getting this vibe, this feel on flat wound strings, like, oh man, it's so pretty, and I, you know, really, you know it's yeah. not holding me back. It was singing back at you. Yeah. So, you, you, you know, I was coming to another place, I go, you know, I think I might really have something here. You know, these flat wound strings, it's sort of woody sound, huh. but playing with your fingers, uh huh, uh huh. You know, this is different. See, I've always felt, as a guitar player, you know, and some people feel differently that, and I knew this when I was about 15, I'd like play with an extremely small pick. Hmm. And I, th- and I realized that it's because I'm closer to the strings. I'm literally closer to the guitar. And then, you know, you move from the pick to the fingers. You know what? It's that connection. Yeah. And I started, I don't know if it's from Wes Montgomery, every time I'd ever play a ballad or anything and solo, I play it with the thumb, not the pick. The, the thumb would give me a different phrasing, more romantic, you know, beautiful, more soulful. You know, Warmth. so I started get I got off Wes Montgomery, started to play with the thumb. Mm. And then, of course, I did years of full right hand classical guitar. And I started, you know, playing with uh, the first three fingers. Stripping I fra- away limitations. Well, you know, and what it does is it gives you um, a different kind of phrasing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's like a, you know, a saxophone player finding that a reed and an embouchure. Yeah. Suddenly I'm finding, yeah, in the hand, the hand equivalent for me was the, the thumb and the first two fingers. And suddenly, like, my speed has got way fast. Huh. And, you know, I'm, I'm phrasing very poetically. Yeah. Whereas with a pick, uh, not as much. You know, the pick is almost taking it away. And there are times when I, I want to use the pick because it's full speed, you know, mm-hmm. you know 100 miles an hour with a pick. But there you go. Anyway, this is sort of internal stuff that, you know, you you know, outside of all the blah, 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 it, there's an inside story. This is like, well, what are you playing with? Side but that's the stuff we love. We love yeah. understanding these things as you make yeah. these choices. Yeah. Just like, I mean, I want to, I don't even know how to ask the question, but when that guitar does talk to you, is there something that triggers maybe in the oh, yeah, back of your absolutely. subconscious where it's like, grab this? Or yeah, something? and I, I picked up one guitar and went, oh, God. <laughs> oh, I can't play. Yes. I can't play. It's not happening. It's not happening. Then I moved to another guitar and other strings until, oh, 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 okay. And it all starts coming out. Yeah. It was there. You know, the one guitar didn't bring it out. The other one, the sound was suddenly, everything's like, now it's magic. Off we go. No problem. I'd like an interlude, interlude with our younger listeners. Uh, what you're hearing from Andy Summers is not counter to the message that we say frequently which is it's not the instrument it's the player yeah and yeah. he and, and this is not a replacement for that statement this is that you've come to a different place where you've exhausted certain instruments and now you need 
an instrument to speak back to you. Mm. Because we all know that kid who says, oh, well, if I only had a, you know, if I had a Les Paul, I'd play better. Yeah, let's comment on that. Yeah, Yeah. I know exactly what you're saying. And, you know, all these magazines, and it's the same in photography that, you know, all the, you know, all the, if I all had the these geeks lenses. and the freaks, they want, they want this thing. They think that's the that's not it at all. Yeah. It's not it. It's all internal. Yeah. It's all in your head. The mind is the camera. The mind is the guitar. You know, mm. this is really true. Uh, to think that it's the gear, but of course, the, you know, all the magazines and the you know, yeah. people are they're saying, so they want to sell you gear. You get this, you're going to be the greatest player. No. Yeah. <laughs> not true. Right. So you unlock it, the fingers. Yeah. <laughs> that's it's, it's all no. I talked to David Neely yesterday downtown on Sunset. He's a luthier. Uh, you mm. guys have done things mm. together before, but he's like, yeah, you don't. It's not Les Paul or Gibson or whatever. Like, you want to make that sound, you just slide your hand back a little bit and raise uh, your hand up, and uh, you'll get that kind yeah, of a sound. Yeah. It's like just within the instrument you have, yeah. exhausting it. Like John was saying, like I know every way to play this thing. I've played above the nut. I've, and I've worn it out. Everything. Yeah. 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 Well, music is a lifetime. Any of the arts is a lifetime, you know, thing. You do it all your life, and you and you 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 come to these things. But one of the first myths to dispel is that it, it's it's just not the instrument. It's it's, it's the head, and and then that's where it really comes from. Yeah. You know, Jeff Beck, for instance, he plays very simply with it through for a Fender Twin, no gear. Mm-hmm. It's all in the hands. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. And he's a yeah. great player, and he's got a signature sound for well, sure. He sure does, and uh, he's not using any pedals, as far as I know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to actually come to the show in San Francisco, by the way. Oh, great. House of Fine Art. First off, you're going to play in L.A. at the, the Regent. At the Regent. Yeah. On the 14th of April. And yeah. then also you'll be at the Palace of Fine Arts yeah. on the 19th of right. April. And I'm for sure going to be there. John's going to be there. Yep. We're going to bring a crowd with us. Great. I want to see this experience. Yeah. The yeah. other thing about these experiences is uh, bring bring your eyes and your ears. And if you wear glasses, wear the glasses. Because, <laughs> you know, I'm nearsighted. And sometimes mm-hmm. I'll go to a show and I'll go, well, I'm going to listen to music. I don't have to wear my glasses. Mm-hmm. But this is going to be a visual experience. Mm-hmm. It's a true multimedia mm-hmm. experience. Mm. Go to andysummers.com and you can link to the ticket purchase page. We're also going to link it on the show page. Yeah. You have given us more than your obligatory half hour that you promised mm. us. And we really appreciate okay. uh, you sitting with us, Andy. This has been a, uh, you know, people tell you don't don't meet your heroes because they disappoint you. And you've been nothing <laughs> but warm and charming and deep and given us lots of stuff. Pete and I were you know, always admirers of you, and we've loved your music for many, many years. Except for Mother. Boy, did that bother me. <laughs> okay. that, was the, that was the point. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what Pete said. That's what yeah, I said. Yeah. I'm like, because we, had, we yeah. had, uh, had Synchronicity fight another album. I can't yeah. remember which one it was. It was Def Leppard Pyromania. Def Leppard Pyromania. It's so a track yeah. for track. And I'm like, yeah. the whole point is that you're supposed to hate it, because it's about your mother and things. <laughs> Well, so, and I want to tell you this because I promised somebody I was going to tell you this. My my wife has a very special relationship with her mother. They're very close, and mm. they're very, you know, it's clearly a mother-daughter relationship, but they are somewhat like sisters. Like, they will mm, bicker. Mm, mm. And so there are times when my wife's ringtone for my mother-in-law is mother. <laughs> so, oh, you must be mad at your mom yeah. for something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's incredible that, that track actually got on that album. We were so popular. You would have yeah. thought the record company wouldn't let us do anything like non, but they kind of accept it. And of course, in a weird way, it was the sort of standout track. Who feels that track, mother? You know, it's really weird, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so anyway. Was, and it set the uh, tone because you, you, you uh, made a statement that allowed your audience to come with you when yeah. you left the police, yeah. you know, and, and know that they were going to get something yeah. different. Yeah. A lot of people liked it, actually, because it was kind of funny and weird, and, yeah. Yeah. you know, that, it, it, it was all right. If you'll indul- I have one question, if you'll indulge this. It, it, so, we asked Stuart, we've asked other people, you know, of your guys' caliber, what music that you are aware of right now, and maybe you just don't follow any kind of popular music, but who's doing what you guys did, you know, really moving the bar forward, speaking for a generation, uh, who's doing that now that are you aware of or you think of? But, I, you know, I'm not really got my ear really close to the ground in terms of, you know, rock or pop music. I'm mean, I just trying to think. You mean like a young band? Yeah. Who, who just, like, who do you hear and, mm. and your ear perks up and maybe you notice? Well, the only one I can think of recently that, you know, and I did get a couple of their records because I thought, oh, they really got something, was a band called Grizzly Bear okay. from New York. Nice. I really like the guy's voice. And I think some of the, 
where they back the songs is really interesting. In particular, Grizzly Bear was the one I liked. Just trying to think if there's any other pop. It's such a unique it. time for a band because anybody can do yeah. it, yeah. but it's very hard to, to accelerate up into the upper levels to really get noticed by a lot of people. You know? Yeah, well, I think Grizzly Bear did all right. I think they played at the Wilton. Oh, okay. Seen it. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah. But, I mean, you know, it's sort of upper echelon. People like Taylor Swift just have no interest whatsoever. In, right. So I just don't listen to stuff like that, you know. Yeah. You know, I mean, uh, I'm personally, I'm very happy to be in my own headspace and my old kind of analog ivory tower yeah. at this point. I don't really care anymore. You <laughs> know, I like to play well. I love playing with other people. Yeah, you know, it's all good. You know, yeah. but I, I can't possibly, you know, be listening to Spotify all day long. I just don't do that. Right. You Sorry. got it in your head anyhow. It's all in my head. Yeah. And I really believe, uh, actually, that you should keep this space in your head sacred. Don't fill it with everyone else's music mm. you know if i listen to everything else how am i going to like come up with anything I, right. you've got to be careful about that you have to be uh, very selective in what you listen to interesting i that sort of is... like wilco a bit you know they made a couple of interesting girls once they got nels klein and nels is good yeah there's, a, there's some stuff that is the wisdom of Andy Summers. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, folks. Yeah. See you later. We like you right where you uh, you yeah. are artistically, and the, your explorations are something that we're going to look forward Great. to. So, The Regent, everybody, go to The Regent in L.A. on uh, April 14th. That's right. Come with uh, Pete and myself to the uh, Palace of Fine Arts. Both beautiful places to see a oh, show and man. places where you can experience. You chose these places for their... Uh, yeah, well, I like the region because, it, again, you know, it's, it's Los Angeles. It's an old art deco theater that's been there since, I think, 1914. Wow. And it's obviously been refurbished. I think it's, uh, I, I went and had a look at it. Yes, yeah, it's, it's good. It's the okay. right size. Palace of Fine Arts, again, another beautiful venue. Mm-hmm. And yeah, the show starts the second you park and start walking up to it. I mean, that's just yeah, a gorgeous part yeah, of the yeah, world, yeah. you know. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. And actually, I mean, I just mentioned this because another unique thing. Um, the night before, I'm doing a big photo show, which will uh, at the uh, Leica Gallery in central San Francisco, wherever it is. It's a beautiful gallery, and I'm showing some of the photos that will be seen with me playing live from a forthcoming book called The Bones of Chuang Tzu. Uh, published by Steidl and uh, so we have a big exhibition at the, the night before and then the next night I do the show so yeah. that's, it's a sort of a, a two-header in San Francisco which is pretty wild I've what's your favorite place before. to eat in San Francisco well usually somewhere in Chinatown okay uh, you know I went to an amazing Chinese but I can't think what it's called the guy said I'd go there it's very funky but the food is incredible you know those yeah, are the best San Francisco. yeah John's got a good yeah. place over there those yeah. are the best yeah. I, I have a place that I go for dim sum yeah, and and the three of us would get completely full on dim sum yeah. for about eleven bucks. Yeah, and I think yeah. that and the closer you get to the place, not only do fewer and fewer people speak English as you get yeah. closer and closer to yeah. the place, but our English will begin to suffer <laughs> yeah. as we as we step <laughs> into the Yeah, yeah. So well, yeah. those Great. are the gems of San Francisco. Yeah, yeah I like it up there. Yeah, yeah. nice. AndySummers.com, everybody, go get your tickets there or at the link on the show page. Andy Summers, we love you. Thank Thank you very very much. much. Great to talk to you.